my uh, wife was talking about earlier and others have been talking about concerning Donald Trump and Samson. Remember Samson with his hair thing. Uh, Samson was not a, quote, godly man in many ways and uh, made many mistakes. But God used Samson to uh, bring down the enemy. Let's put it that way. And uh, uh, that's, that's what happened. Uh, again, I find it interesting that Donald Trump doesn't drink. Now, you may think, what's significant about that? Well, there's plenty of scripture verses on that. Uh, in, uh, I'm not saying you can't have some wine. Or, I'm not telling you not that. I'm just telling you the, the, uh, the correlation and the representation there about Donald Trump and that and uh, how God is using him is, to me, a biblical proportion. And I think there's biblical signs here. It'll be interesting to see how God works this whole thing out. And I'm going to reiterate again, stand with him in faith. I don't even care if Hillary Clinton gets elected by hook or crook or whatever you want to call it. You stand with the Almighty and be whole Bible-believing people. And <laughs> I think if Hillary's elected, it ought to drive you to your knees and drive you to the Word of God even more. But even if Donald Trump is elected, certainly we ought to be driven to our knees and to the Word of God even more and be a people of the faith. And that's who we are to be. That's, who, that's our calling, the, the faith of Abraham, the seed of Abraham, ye seed of Abraham, be of that Abrahamic faith. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles, please, to um, the book of Acts, chapter 17. And just, again, bear with me this morning. If I'm a little bit slow, <laughs> I'm doing my best. And I have some important things to share with you on... As you've heard me say before on Saul Linsky, I think we're going to get to them today. Um, you know, what I think I'm going to do right now is, there's a number of you watching right now on DVD, and, and uh, of course you can't see it if you're on CD, but in back of me I have the Amer uh, Confederate flag. And uh, some of you might be offended at it. I don't know. I don't know all of you. I don't know everybody's mindset, what they're thinking of this. But I want to assure you, it's not the evil flag that the enemy portrays it to be. I have um, a few things I want to read on this, and there's so much more uh, that we could get into. But the Confederate, what, what the Confederate flag means in basically is this, quote, it says here that uh, on the Confederate, what the Confederate flag means, it says here, the Confederate flag in all its design flew from 1861 to 1865, first flying in uh, South Carolina. Now, of course, we know South Carolina made it a big deal to bring down that flag as of recently. But it was first flown in South Carolina. The original flag was known as the Stars and Bars. This square flag had seven stars representing the seven states that seceded from the United States. But the most recognized flag of the era is known as the Confederate Navy Jack. The color red. The red represents the valor of the Confederacy. As in the case of the original United States flag, it represented hardiness and the willingness of and the willingness to sacrifice. The blue, the blue of the Confederate flag is 
a dark or navy blue. The blue was also known as Bonnie Blue. It was first used in the Louisiana state flag and was thought to represent Southern pride. The blue of the flag later was also known to represent justice as well as the perse uh, perseverance and determination of the people. The stars uh, says here, added one star to the Confederate uh, flag for each state of the Confederacy. The first seven stars, as I said earlier, represented belong to South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. After the Battle of Fort Su Sumter, flags were added for Virginia, Arkansas, South Carolina, and Tennessee. And the cross. What looks like an X on the Confederate Jack is actually the cross of St. Andrew. And Andrew, of course, you know, being one of the disciples of Christ. Uh, Andrew was the first disciple, it says here, of Jesus, who later in his life became a martyr. When the Roman, Roman government set about his crucifixion, Andrew protested. It is reported he asked to be crucified in the form of an X as he didn't feel worthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. The Confederate leadership <clears throat> apparently felt inspired by Andrew's fortitude and adopted his cross in their flag. Don't y'all find this bit of history concerning the Confederate flag interesting? Um, I have more to read on this. I'm going to skip some of this. It's all good, but uh, I do want to get this in. This is from Chuck Baldwin, and it's uh, he wrote this October 27, 2016. Uh, and he's uh, going back to April 9, 1865. And he says this in his article concerning the Confederate flag and that history. This is the date when General Robert E. Lee, meaning April 9, 1865, surrendered the army of, the, of uh, Northern Virginia to Ulysses S. Grant at um, uh, Appomattox. What? Appomattox. Sorry, uh, Courthouse, Virginia, regardless of where one comes from, on the subject of the war between the states, one fact is undeniable. Abraham Lincoln seriously dismantled the Jeffersonian model of federalism in America. Ever since Lincoln's presidency, virtually every battle that the free men has fought for the principles of, li of limited government, state sovereignty, personal liberty, etc., stemmed directly from Lincoln's usurpation of power and subjugation and forced union of what used to be, quote, free and independent states, the Declaration of Independence. In fact, the philosophical battles being waged today regardless regarding every encroachment upon liberty and state autonomy by our federal government have their roots in Lincoln's uh, autocracy. And then he goes to uh, July 9th, 1868. This is the date when the 14th Amendment was ratified. This amendment codified into law what Lincoln had forced at Bayonet Point. Until then, people were deemed citizens, citizens of their respective states. Constitution nowhere referred to people as U.S. citizens. 
it only recognized the citizens of each state. Notice also that the citizenship was only recognized among the several states, not among people living in non-state territories. Until the 14th Amendment, people were, quote, citizens of each state, end of quote. Article 4, Section 2, Paragraph 1. The 14th Amendment created a whole new class of persons, quote, citizens of the United States, end of quote. This false notion of one nation overturned the Jeffersonian principle that America was a confederated republic, a voluntary union of states. I thought that was very interesting and certainly goes along with why we have this flag now in the back of us. Okay. Uh, that I'm going to have to put aside. And let us go now to where I was uh, originally going to have us go. In Acts chapter 17. And I don't know why I turn to chapter 20. Go a few. 17 and verse 26. Very interesting uh, Bible passages here in Acts 17, verse 26. <clears throat> Quote Paul says, And hath made of one. Now it says blood after this. And I know some heads are going up right now. Is he going to get this right? Well, the word blood was inserted. It's not in the original text. So when you're reading this verse, don't read it with that word blood in there. All right? It says, and made of one all nations. And this term nations means ethnos. Of, uh, made of one all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times and before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Now there's other verses that in the scriptures it talks about the bounds of the nations according to the number of the children of Israel. You can look that up yourself. So that's what the Apostle Paul is uh, referring to here. It's an Israelite statement concerning what God was going to do with the Israelite people. And, uh, and what is God going to do with his Israelite people? Well, think about the new covenant. He's going to bring the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern house of Israel together in one Make them one again under the bonds of the covenant. The new covenant is not uh, doing away with the old covenant as far as its purpose. Uh, what Christ is affirming and what the Word of God affirms is the truth of that Abrahamic covenant that was originally given to uh, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And everyone was originally given, was given to uh, Abraham. And uh, that all can be traced to, for instance, uh, Hebrews 8, verses 8 through 10. I would encourage you to go there and look that up if you're not familiar with it. Because the new covenant is only unto Israel. I will state that again, that a lot of people call themselves New Covenant Christians and they don't have any concept. They do not have a real biblical understanding of what that New Covenant purpose is, what it states clearly in the Word of God, and how to properly interpret that New Covenant. Again, the people of the Old Covenant are the people of the New Covenant. There isn't some change there. God's not changing his, his original covenant with Israel and now making that covenant into all people, all races. 
That's not what he's saying. That's not what he's doing at all. All right, going on to verse 27. That they should seek the Lord, Israel, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us, meaning, in context, every one of Israel. That's who Paul is talking to here. That's what he's referring to. Verse 28, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own po poets have said. Now he's speaking to uh, these people who are of the northern house of Israel. You could call them Greeks. You could call them Gentiles. And, uh, and uh, so he went unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel in many ways. We could say that. And the lost sheep of the house of Israel uh, were in, who, in whom the, the, the uh, missionary uh, destiny of the Apostle Paul was unto the Gentiles meaning those of the northern house of Israel, where they had been dispersed. And that included those of the Roman Empire, the Romans, and the book of Romans, look at it, the book of Romans was unto the, those of the northern, gentilized, dispersed house of Israel. The Greeks were a part of that. And those in Spain and uh, England and uh, France, and Germany, and throughout Europe, they were Israelites who had been divorced again and dispersed and of the northern house of Israel. So if you don't have that history and you don't understand that history, uh, you're going to be lost as to the real meaning and purpose of what the scriptures are saying. And I have to add this. Folks, the Judeo-Christians have got it wrong. They've got it wrong on so many levels and in so many areas of the Scripture. It's, they're really, they might as well be reading out of the encyclopedia because the way that they are interpreting it is a lie. They're in, they are putting forth a falsity, a lie that they've woven into their, quote, gospel. And I know this is uh, going to be maybe a little bit hard for some of you and some people out there to hear this. And that's why Pastor Barley harps so much on the dangers of Judeo-Christianity. And we're going to have to face the fact and come to understand the fact, and if you don't, you need to do more studying on this, that again, we have been lied to. And that there is a clear difference between their gospel and what the true gospel is, the Word of God. And the way that people have, uh, churches, have been interpreting the Bible is grossly wrong in so many areas. And this is just one little example of it right here. Just like I said, the New Covenant Gospel. What is the truth concerning that gospel? How is it presented? How is it taught in Judeo-Christianity? Well, then we could go to the law. Well, how is the law interpreted? How is the law presented? We could go from there to all kinds of areas, including the rapture. Is the rapture doctrine true biblical doctrine as the Judeo-Christians teach it, as Catholicism teaches it? No. Way back, uh, Catholicism was injected by Jesuits into their a Catholic doctrine, let's say, and it was presented as truth, and the Protestants bit into it later in, uh, uh, after the uh, pilgrims, but they bit into it and adopted these 
uh, false doctrines, false teachings, false theology into their Protestant faith. And it's been woven into their seminaries, into their colleges, and we've all and they've all become basically one, though there are many quote denominations and confusion by these denominations that have only added to the confusion of the true Christian faith. We should be one. Hear me out. We should be one church. We should be one body. We should be one Israelite Bible-believing body of people, and we are not. That deserves another set of messages in and of itself. But are you all hearing me on this and what I, where I'm coming from? I don't want to be misunderstood here. And yes, I am clearly and I am plainly telling you that we have been lied to and we've been misinformed and there's going to have to be a change and it's going to come. And you may say, well, how is it going to come? Well, let me use the election as an example. Whether Donald Trump wins or not, there's a change that has taken place, and he's done a pretty good job of uh, shaking things up. God Almighty really has done a great job in shaking things up, has he not? And you say, well, how could, how could there be this change? We need a change. When and how? Folks, have faith. God can do it in his own timing, in his own way. Who, who, and, and if you ask the people in England, would you have thought that Brexit would have been possible? I'm sure the majority of them would have thought, even those that voted for it would have thought, well, there's probably little chance or it's not going to happen. And yet it did happen. I don't know the future again. I am not a prophet. But jo, jo, I mean, uh, Donald Trump, could be used of God to make a lot of significant changes, just as he used David, just as he used Samson, and he's used other uh, men of God in the Bible who were not necessarily godly people to bring about some powerful changes. Um, let me go on here, because there's two other verses in Acts here that I want to get into. Uh, and then we'll move on. Quote verse 28. For in him we live, live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own prophets have said. We went over that. For we also are his offspring. Offspring. What is that word for offspring? Seed. The seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the God has a likened to gold or silver or stone or graven by art or men's devices. What does that mean? There's no idolatry. Amen? No, we're not to put up with idolatry. Are we putting up with idolatry today? You bet we are putting up with idolatry. There are to be no other gods but the Lord Jesus Christ. But how many people today are saying, yes, we can have Jesus plus this? I mean, you, you look at all the ways in which we are be being manipulated. Um, just look at the various denominations again. We won't get into the politics and what's going on politically today and, and in the acceptance of homosexuality, which is having other gods before us. When you do away with God's law and, and uh, uh, abor allow abortion, emphasize murder, and all these other things, those are having other gods before you because God Almighty doesn't teach that. Molech teaches that, right? For As an example, Baalism uh, teaches other gods. But when you get into the false doctrine that, that is taught by a lot of these denominations, take the Catholic Church and the worship of, quote, Mother Mary. Is that biblical? Are we to worship Mary, Jesus' uh, mother? Just a question. I mean, uh, just a person with a 
basic understanding of the New Testament, let's just say. We'll limit to the New Testament. It's quite obvious we are not to worship Mary. But do the Catholics? Yes, the Catholics worship Mary. How about the rosary? Is that something we are to do? We are supposed to rub the rosary and pray to the rosary and do... There, no, that's paganism. When you roll back the curtain on all the false doctrines and all the various forms of idolatry that are, have been adopted and paganism that has been adapted by Catholicism and then also adapted by Protestantism and used in the Protestant faith today, there is corruption beyond what we can even comprehend. I mean, people talk about uh, the Democrats and look at all the corruption of the Democrats. Well, look at all the corruption that the Republicans have adopted and what the, covenant, the Republicans represent. Have they been friends to you, the people, we the people of the United States of America? Are they standing on um, righteous principles? Are they doing the things that will help and benefit and strengthen our nation? Or, are they, or have they been proponents of one-worldism and globalism? And NAFTA. You know, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Look at Trump. He's the one that has been first in bringing up a lot of these issues that the Democrat, I mean, that the Republicans wouldn't dare have brought up, including the immigration problem and the border issue. Everybody said, oh, you're crazy. Don't bring that up. Why, that's something we want to avoid. We want the Mexican vote. Here comes Trump when he running, when he first started running right out of his mouth is we've got to take on this dangerous nation destroying immigra- fa- uh, false immigration policy because it's bringing these people in. They're paganiz- paganizing us. And he said, which they don't like there, they're bringing in rapists. These rapists are coming in. These murderers are coming in. Oh, that's horrible. Don't you say that. And yet, that's what they've done. I mean, these cities of refuge? Come on. Who set up these cities like San Francisco as cities of refuge? Where did that come from? Where did this corruption of the church come in where the church, they can go into the Catholic churches and get refuge and you can't touch them? They're safe zones. What about separation of church and state? They're all the time telling us. I don't see any separation of church and state there, do you? Nope. <laughs> you know, the average church, again, they would just be appalled at what Pastor Barley is saying. Now, oh, Pastor, we're not supposed to bring politics into religion. That's the problem. Yes, we are. And that's the problem. We've not brought God's word into politics. And therefore, you allow anything because we cannot, we cannot stand on the principles of King Jesus. We cannot stand upon his law word. We cannot talk about God's law. We can only talk about this word love and we're free to politically to pervert that word love and and, and make anything we want to out of it because they made love into an idolatrous word and idolatrous concepts that have perverted our nation and the people's thinking. But, so I like that. No silver, no gold, no, no graven images or art, and, and man's devices. No man's devices. No, but what do people harp on today? Man's devices, man's thinking, man's manipulation, man's socialism, man's communism, man's new world orderism, man's globalism. All this, by the way, is meant to destroy the Christian faith. Make no mistake about it. 
What are we to do? We're to be people of the faith. We're to stand upon the faith. We're to uphold the faith. We are to be standing upon the rock of Jesus Christ and his word, his solid rock Bible word. We're to be people of the faith. What's the enemy's objective? What are the terrors? What are the wolves? What's their objective? Is to attack the word of God. Who's the word? Jesus Christ, the Bible, his word. And we are to believe that word and stand upon that word, which is from Genesis to Revelation. And man's uh, religion today, which has seeped into the Christian faith, has gradually and progressively, may I use their term, systematically been used to destroy the Word of God. And the churches have been infiltrated. Make no mistake about that. The churches have been, manip- uh, have been infiltrated and manipulated. They have watered down the gospel. If you take truth and you water down that truth, what happens to the truth? Well, it becomes a lie. And though they and in that, they will continue to use the the term Bible, Christian, and make it sound holy. But if you've removed the biblical Word of God substance from it, it's still an idol, a falsity. That's liberalism. Another word, as I've said before, for liberalism is socialism. And when we embrace liberalism, we are embracing the destruction of Christianity. Think about it now. When you embrace liberalism, which dilutes the Word of God into eventually nothingness. I mean, just think back in the last 50 years how they diluted and attacked the Word of God over and over and over and over. It's not by accident, and I hope to prove it to you today, it's by plan. And it is a Jewish plan. Communism is based upon Jewish Talmudic ideology. Whether you like to hear that or not, I'm telling you the truth, dear friends. I want to talk to you a little bit about Saul Alinsky. Saul Alinsky. I like to call him Saul Alinsky. Witzenberger. And he is a Jew. America is rotting from inside and liberal liberalism or relative, relativism is why. But you see, that's the very doctrine of Saul Alinsky. That's the very doctrine of Karl Marx. All these communists have this uh, have been uh, eager portrayers of this false doctrine, of this progressivism, of this liberalism. In the early 1950s, Bella Dodd, a one-time ranking official in the American Communist Party, gave congressional testimony in which she stated, quote, In the early 1930s, we put 1,100 men into the priesthood. Think about it. And I bet you it's more, if we really could see and understand the full number. And this is, the, this is in the 1930s, she says this, 1,100 men 
into the priesthood in order to destroy the church from within. Now, she's talking about the Catholic Church. Okay, but you just expand that. Do you think that they stopped with the Catholic Church? No way. She goes on to say, quote, Right now they are in the highest places in the church. Who? Communist. They put 1,100 men into the church to destroy the church. In a lecture at a university, Dr. Dodd said, quote, In 1944, there was a national convention for the Communist Party, which I was elected to the National Committee openly in Madison Square Garden. During the uh, convention, there were many people that came from all over the United States. Dodd went on to say, quote, One of the social events that I attended was a dinner given by Alexander Trotschenberger, who is a Jew, by the way, I might add, who is a known socialist graduate at, of Yale, and he is also, she said, a millionaire, who's head of the publishing firm for the communist. And at the end of the evening, Trotschenberg rose to make a little speech in which he said, quote, when we get ready to take the United States, we will not take it under the label of communism. We will not take it under the, lab under the label of socialism. These labels are unpleasant to the American people and have been spirit and have been speared too much. We will take the United States under the labels we have made very lovable. We will take it, follow me now, we will take it under liberalism, under progressivism, under democracy. We will, but take it, we will, end of quote from Alexander Trotschenberger in 1944, quoted by Bella Dodd in early 1950s. Now, if that doesn't wake you up, I don't know what will, ladies and gentlemen. To say that Joseph McCarthy was right about communism, plot over America, yes, but I would say his mistake was that he underestimated the number of communists. Rules for Radicals. That book, and he's written others, but the main one that people talk about is Rules for Radical, was written by a Jew, Saul Alinsky. And you know what he stated over and over? Is the end justifies the means. And Hillary Clinton is a disciple of Saul Alinsky, a Zionist, communist Jew. He radically organized non-white people against white people. He fathered, fathered the term racist, and Hillary and Obama were disciples of his to a large degree, only they enlarged upon what Saul Alinsky believed. I want to read to you some of Saul Alinsky's rules. I will not be, read them all, but I'll read a number of them for you. Here's one of them. Quote, Power is not only what you have, but what the enemy th thinks you have. Power is der derived from two main sources, money and people, he says. The have-nots must build power from flesh and and blood. Well, that's an interesting statement from flesh and blood, not from God Almighty, not from the Bible, not from the Word of God, but upon the power of the people. Communism, socialism, liberalism, progressivism. 
Here's another one. He says, whenever possible, go outside the expertise of the enemy. Might I add, that's to confuse them. Look for ways to increase insecurity. Think about this, anxiety and uncertainty. Do you feel anxiety and uncertainty? Folks, it's not by accident. They're following a plan and a program in many ways laid out by Saul Alinsky. Here's another one, another rule of his. Of his. Make the enemy live up to its own book of rules. Isn't that an interesting statement? Make the enemy, which it us, all of us that oppose communism, socialism, and liberalism, make us live up to our own book of rules. Well, first of all, you know what? I agree with that. I want you to live up to the Word of God and follow biblical principles and, and, the, and God's law. Can I get an amen on that? So, uh, you know what, Saul Linsky, I agree with you on that. I'm more than willing to be forced, not for, maybe not forced, but I believe we ought to live up to God's Word. Do you? Again, I know you agree with me on that, but I just want to make note of this, what he's saying here, because it is very interesting They're, to their own rules. If the rule is that every letter, letter gets a reply, Every letter gets a reply. He says, send 30,000 letters. You can kill them with this because no one can possibly obey all their own rules. Well, you can see how, you know, when you're looking at Judeo-Christianity and the gospel of grace, and we don't have law, and we can't, you know, Let's not be so dogmatic about God's Word. How you can infiltrate uh, that Judeo-Christian belief. And that's what he's talking about. He knows Judeo-Christianity. He was heavily involved in the Catholic Church, by the way, might I add. Okay, here's another one. Ridicule a man's most potent weapon. There is no defense. It's irrational. It's infuriating. It also works as a key pressure point to force the enemy into concessions. Again, ridicule a man's most potent weapon? Ridicule. And what do uh, most of uh, the people do? They get all defensive about it, and they get off point, and they start, this is a distraction, and you can see it in politics. They throw something at you totally ridiculous and get you dwelling on that when their real objective is over here. It's sleight of hand. It's manipulation. It's philosophy. It's communist philosophy and manip manipulation. Uh, okay, here's another one. A good tactic is one your people enjoy, is one your people enjoy. They keep doing it without urging and come back to do more. They're doing their thing and will even suggest better ones. Okay, let me repeat that. A good tactic is one your people enjoy, one the liberals enjoy, he's saying. One that they enjoy, and they'll keep doing it without urging and come back to do more. Homosexuality. What have they done? They've gone on to encourage that, where now it's just almost acceptable to be a pedophile, a transgender, all that. You keep doing what you enjoy doing, what Saul Linsky is saying. The ends justifies the means. And isn't that what they're doing? The, uh, these liberals, these progressives, even these Democrats, as we read earlier. Okay. Uh, he says, quote, another rule. Keep the pressure on. Never let up. 
Well, isn't that them? They never let up. Keep trying new things to keep the opposition off balance. As the opposition masters one approach, hit them from the flank with something new. These are Saul Linsky, Hillary Clinton objectives. She was one of his followers. The major premise for tactics in the development and operation of this, he says, will maintain a constant pressure upon the opposition. It is this unceasing pressure that results in the reaction from the opposition that are essential to the success of the campaign. Lastly, the pick the targets, freeze it, personalize it, polarize it. Cut off the support network and isolate targets from sympathy. Go after people and not institutions. People are hurt faster than institutions. You know, uh, I haven't gotten real heavy into this this morning. But the enemy, at the very least, you can see, is very cunning. And um, as I read through these, and I only have, I have a, there's so much on Saul Linsky and, and this uh, corruption that I haven't got into, but I could clearly see Hillary Clinton everywhere in, there, in this ca campaign that you're seeing run right now. I'm seeing Saul Alinsky, all these principles that uh, he stood for and promoted, I'm seeing them. We're further, if it just, we're further down than even I imagined when, as I was looking through this. It was shocking to me in so many ways. Because, again, there's so much I haven't gotten into, but I want to close with having us go to the Word of God, and um, that would be 2 Timothy 3, 12. Oh, come on. Okay. Well, I've got 2 Timothy. Here we go. Uh, verse 12. And we'll read through verse uh, 17. Quote, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I'm sure a lot of you aren't, don't like hearing that, but that's what the Word of God says. And we are, and we will experience that. Okay? But evil men and seduce, seduce, seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Well, can't we see that? Absolutely. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. He's speaking to Israelites, folks. As a child, you've been taught these things. You know these things. Which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Hallelujah. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let's remember that. Let's remember the power of God's word. Let's remember that must be and remain our source of truth. That is our foundation that we must stand upon. We'll close in prayer. Lord Jesus, again, we just love your word. And we're trying to present truths in these various lessons about your word and what your word and your truth says.
And yes, in this we're trying to expose what the terrors are doing, the tactics and the beliefs and the philosophy of the terrors. May we know and understand who these terrors are, what they're all about. But may we equally understand that you are our Savior, our Redeemer. You are the word of life that we are to stand upon, agree upon, declare, preach it, teach it, and be faithful servants of your word in all that we do every day. Be faithful servants of your word and to be the Abrahamic people of faith as you called us to be. Amen and amen.